All right, let's get this show on the road. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Torn Tuesday, your weekly dose of all things Lord of the Rings, Hobbit. We've got a special show for you today because there's new Tolkien at your bookstore starting this week. <laughs> multiple editions of the updated and revised Letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, not Letters It's so of exciting. Tolkien. This, is, this is the most exciting news that we could possibly have. You know, we love to talk about, oh, a new movie's coming out. Oh, cool. A new TV show's coming out. That's fine. But there's really nothing that gets our blood flowing, like new publications and new J.R.R. Tolkien, even all these years later, after he left us in 1973. It is a terrific bit of news for the entire Tolkien community. Uh, special thanks to you, Justin, for helping us put the show on the road. Hello, I'm Clifford Broadway, and welcome, everybody. You're back here again at another weekly edition of Torn Tuesday. It is lovely to have you all here. And I see, I see so many of our regular viewers on Facebook, on YouTube, on yes. Twitch, and on, on X or Twitter Absolutely. or Zitter or whatever we're calling it. We're calling it a failed state at this point, and I don't know it's why. It's a, 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 a failed, a, a, yes, it's a failed crap fest of a social platform, but that's a, another conversation for another day, perhaps. Um, I'm very pleased to see in the YouTube chat with us, there is... The Wonder of Tolkien, who's down there with his family doing a New Zealand journey, having the wonderful Middle Earth experience. And there's Dern the Seventh, and oh, holy cow, there's Carl Hostetter himself. It is a unique pleasure to have you here, Carl. Um, uh, also a Tolkien scholar and editor of profound significance in his own right. Uh, guess who we've got? It looks like it's two <laughs> o'clock in Wellington. Uh, I can't. You know, smartphones. I want to be but... there. My favorite use of smartphones is it tells me all my favorite cities' times right now, so I get my mm -hmm. global Zoom meetings correctly. <laughs> so it's two in the afternoon, <laughs> uh, but we have a very special guest uh, with us today to talk about the new letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. What's changed? What's been revised? What's new? Why should people get this book? We're happy to have Jeremy from Tolkien Collector's Guide. Yes, Tolkien Guide. Dot com. Welcome, Jeremy. Hello, Jeremy. Great. Hey. Hi, Clifford. Hi, Justin. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited about this book. It's going to be great to talk about it. I mean, we were, there's, we were just, there's, we were, there's a we, thing. There's a thing called sticking all the post-its and these extra little <laughs> marks. I don't do this to the Lord of the Rings. I don't even do this to the Silmarillion. You know what I do this to? The letters. It's the letters mm -hmm. where I keep referencing and coming back to super important bits and I'm I'm, it's crazy. I've been doing this all my life. Now I have a whole new edition that we can do this to. Well, uh, let, let me bring up. So you can pre-order on on our on your favorite bookstore, uh, local bookstore. Please shop local when you can. You can pre-order it anywhere you get books. You can also get it online. Order it at, uh, of course, the big behemoth is Amazon.com. This is the revised and expanded edition. Here's the difference. You can tell that you're getting the new version it is his name is in his signature and if we go to the previous version um you can see at the top there's a there's a little colored bar i think it's usually purple uh that says the letters of J.R. tolkien in a just rat rat regular font so you want to make sure that the cover that you have at least is, this is for the u.s market uh, has Tolkien's signature like this uh, and of course edited and selected by Humphrey Carpenter with the assistance of Christopher Tolkien. Cliff, you were just talk telling us about Humphrey Carpenter. This this book is supposed to be a companion piece? Well, the uh, the original soft cover trade paperbacks that I have uh feature the authorized biography and I know there's been others, but this is the one, this is the one authorized biography that the Tolkien estate has, you know, blessed. And this was the one that was written by Humphrey Carpenter. Al along, here's this sister edition of the letters. And you see how the, the formatting is the same. There's Humphrey Carpenter across the top. He was the main editor of this volume of letters, if I'm not mistaken, um, with the uh -huh. assistance of Christopher at the time. So here, look, and side by side on the bookshelf, they're meant to be the same design with somebody's name right across the top. 
and familiar black and white photos of the professor himself. Um, a lot of people would say that Mr. Carpenter's biography is maybe a little tiny, tiny bit on the dry side, um, but that's okay. I, I find that's the case when I read most biographies anyways. I read a biography about Tim Burton and it's dry. It's just the way it is. But <laughs> no, no, no fault to Mr. Carpenter. You want the real story of the man and his life and his, his real experiences, his lived experiences. You need to get that Carpenter biography and, and just absorb it and digest it. As long as you're also doing it with the letters, with the letters side by side, uh, they actually do figure in my mind as companion pieces to each other that's it uh, yeah that's, absolutely that's very inter interesting you know i thought we'd start uh this book the letters of J.R. tolkien uh has a very unique place in the fandom and is unique to uh many other authors because it is yeah. uh tolkien's personal communications to his business associates, to his family, to his son in on the on the front lines of the war, to to fans, to fan sites, to fan furious groups. fans, yeah, um, Inqui so inquisitive fans. And this man is the busiest academic in Oxford, and he's piling on lots of extra work on himself, answering fan letters. It's just he's remarkable to so have I this as in his voice it's remarkable I'm, i want i want to get from each of us here and maybe w i'll let jeremy go first uh what is the core value of this book the letters of J.R. tolkien why should this be on everybody's shelf so that's a great question and for the first edition and a large part of this revised edition it was aimed at fans of middle earth so i don't have an exact count but 40 50 percent of the letters are tolkien talking about publication of the hobbit and the lord of the rings uh answering fans queries changing his mind on how things would work and then those ended up getting you know absorbed into future editions but uh, you know his his imagination had been going for you know 50 plus years when he was answering fan letters and it never stopped he was he was working on this legendarium uh his entire lifetime and so the letters gets us that view of, of middle earth and that's really that's what a lot of fans i think go into this book looking for is like did he ever tell us the, you know the name of uh, aragorn and arwen's daughters and you know the little bits of information that they really want to know and they can't ask him now but maybe somebody asked him you know, back in the 60s or 70s. And so they go looking for that. But then there's, there's a significant amount of family history that that we don't get through the dry biography and, and through, you know, the prefaces and forewords to these books. So seeing him write to his wife and the TCBS, his friends uh, from, from growing up, and to... Christopher is just amazing in, in the letters to Christopher because Christopher was a, you know, a primary focal point of writing The Lord of the Rings. Uh, Tolkien was sending chapters to Christopher who was deployed and in the Royal Air Force and said, you know, what do you think? And what should I write next? And, and where is this going? It's getting away from me. And so we get to see Christopher's letter the letters to christopher from tolkien as as he's working his way through the 40s of, of writing the lord of the rings uh, but also you know little snippets of view of, of family and religion and and business and, and 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 everything else is going on so it's you know to me it, it's hard to pick a favorite portion of his letters that's more important than the other i just love bouncing back and forth between those those different categories well, mm -hmm. I think uh, Cliff just showed us his, his heavily earmarked book, so I'll, I'll let him <laughs> go last. Uh, but I, from my perspective, the, this book, The Letters of Tolkien, is really important if in the pop culture space because uh, so many times there the fan debates are almost always about uh, author intent versus filmmaker intent versus fan reaction and what we what we interpret a a, a character doing a, you know why was this why is this like that this book is so unique because 
uh, you have the author, in his own words, in black and white, basically, uh, he spent his lifetime answering fan questions and publisher questions about the, a lot of the same topics that we still debate today, and he's actually already answered it, and it, 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 it's right there in black and white. So, I this is this book is important for everybody to pick up to win those online debates. Uh, so that that way, you, you know, if there's uh, if if you're ever challenged about anything in Tolkien or the movies or the books or the TV show, you can go open up this book uh, with even more pages and letters and and additions to letters that were edited out last time and you can f mm -hmm. possibly find a reason uh, a reason that you can win an online debate but cliff i think you've used your book the most here what My. what value is this <laughs> book to everybody um it's valuable for me because of the past 20 odd years i've been writing content for the one ring.net and I would never want to assume to have written any article with any perspective, either scholarly or entertainment wise, without actually having good, thorough knowledge of the man and his life that I'm talking about. And I started my education seriously, uh, not just like, oh, I'm consuming The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings year after year after year, and just here's the Silmarillion and let me consume that and absorb all the ephemera. When I really thought to myself, I'm going to take this seriously as a writer for the one ring.net, these were my gateway books into all other scholarship for Tolkien. All my Tolkien studies began simply with the letters and with the Humphrey Carpenter biography. Um, it's genuinely uh, an important and foundational. I think that's an inappropriate adjective. It's a foundational approach to learning about the professor. It probably starts with these two books. And um, I'm particularly fond of learning how <laughs> his raw optimism kind of got away from him. Uh, here's a letter <laughs> to his publisher. This is letter number 34, really early in the book. This was dated in 1938. And <laughs> keep in mind, folks, the, the big joke comes up. And we compare the other date later on. But in October of 1938, Professor Tolkien is telling his publisher, you know, I'm in, I've been working very hard for a month on a sequel to The Hobbit. It has reached chapter 11, though in a rather ineligible state. Uh, though in rather an illegible state, bless his syntax, it's better than mine ever could be. Chapter 11 is A Knife in the Dark, in case you guys want to remember, that's where Frodo encounters the Nazgul, and they're attacked, and he's stabbed with the, the Morgul knife. So, Professor Tolkien says, I am now thoroughly engrossed in it, and I have all the threads, all in hand. Uh, and, and then he goes on to say in the next letter, uh, paragraph, um, when I spoke in an earlier letter to Mr. Firth of this sequel getting, air quotes, out of hand, I didn't mean it to be complimentary to the process. I really meant it was running its course and forgetting children. So he's warning his publisher that he is leaving the previous audience behind in shape of something else that's coming out of his pen. And he says, and it was becoming more terrifying than The Hobbit. It may prove quite unsuitable. It is more adult, but my own children who criticize it, there's a reference to Christopher right there, my own children mm -hmm. who criticize it, as it appears, are now older. However, you will be the judge of that, I hope, someday. And he, he literally says, um, I still live in hopes that I may be able to submit it early next year. In late 38, he wanted to submit his Lord of the Rings story in 1939. And we all know it wasn't published until July 1954. He was a decade and some length of time optimistic in a way, way over ambitious and delightful way. And to see him so uh, just speaking naturally and organically to his publisher saying, I know you want me to write more children's lit. I know that I had a bestseller on my hands, but... I'm writing something else now, and it's just running its course. It's just, this is, it's what it's doing, and I'm engrossed with it, and I think you'll be excited. Wait till you see what I got next year. And then that was just a super tease, because for the next years and years and years, his publisher was going, where is it? 
where is it? What are you doing? What do you, you know, it, it, it's nuts when you get a little glimpse of his optimism early on compared to the publication reality. It's just a delightful insight into how he was feeling at the time, you know? Well, we're, <laughs> we're going to get into uh, 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 some of the changes and updates uh, that TolkienGuide.com has, has wonderfully put together. Uh, but oh, yes. you reading that passage reminded me, I guess, that the, the, the important thing that everybody should get this book for uh, mm -hmm. is uh, he, he. you just heard him call out letter 33. Well, the fact is this 34. book, this book is actually where all of the letters got numbered. Anytime you're uh, on the internet or anywhere and you see someone reference letter 151 or letter 73 or le letter 34, uh, it's from this book. This book is where they numbered the letters. And that's where everybody is referencing, you know, when Tolkien talks about this or Tolkien talks about that in letter X, you know, num number one, two, three. This is it. Th th this is the definitive book. It's, uh, like, it's like scripture uh, notation, honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If someone says, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, anybody in the room would be like, oh, yeah, love is not boastful. Love is not proud. It holds no record of wrongs. You know, you mention Bible verse and bam, just like that, you mention letter numbers and Tolkien scholars and Tolkien aficionados are also instantly clued in by that system. Yes, that's right. Uh, so at uh, TolkienGuide.com, uh, you can see right there on their front page, they've got a video unboxing of the book. And they at the very top, they've got a PDF download. And, and this PDF is constantly updated. It's already been updated a few times over the weekend. Uh, <laughs> it's not video uh, friendly necessarily. It's, a, it, it, it's a, a reference PDF that you can download for free. So I think we can just talk through some of these uh, yeah. uh, some of these updates. Uh, so uh, I guess Jeremy, uh, why why don't you lead the conversation here? Because there's a lot of wonderful updates, and maybe start with how how many changes are there? Are there new letters, or are, are the letters uh, uh, are, are there additional letters in here? So if this book is, I haven't counted words or pages, uh, about fifty percent longer. Um, it's it's not not quite double in length, but it, it's much larger. There were 354 numbered letters as Clifford was just, uh, was just talking about. So, so we've known about those since 1981. So one through 354, uh, this new edition has 508 total letters in it. So they've added 154 additional letters that are, that are brand new. Um, and they're scattered uh, throughout. There's there's letters um, across five different decades uh, in there. Um, so so they're interspersed with the original 354 letters. So the, they didn't change the numbering scheme in here. Uh, all of the uh, additional letters now are chronologically, for the most part, uh, 99 percent they are tucked in between existing letters so for example there's a letter 8a which has been inserted between letter 8 and letter 9 in the new edition so the a doesn't mean it's relating to letter 8 it's not you know a, a follow-on it's just chronologically falling between 8 and 9 so they use the the alpha numerics for for these new letters to drop them in um, and then there are in addition to those 154 there's 45 letters that were in the first edition, but had to be edited down for length to, to get the book to be publishable um, from, from the page count that they were allotted. Um, 45 letters have been updated. So they have paragraphs restored to them that were in the original letter and, and Carpenter and uh, Christopher Tolkien knew about them. In fact, we'll, we'll come back in a moment to, to what this revised edition is, how it came about, but so, so there, these paragraphs have been restored to 54 letters. So there's over 200 letters that are different, that have additional material or brand new in this edition that you need to go check out. So a question we get all the time is, you know, why is this still say edited by Humphrey Carpenter? He's not around. How did he manage to edit this revised edition? Uh, and that's actually, interestingly, it's chronologically backwards because Carpenter, working very closely with Christopher, had 
put together a draft or a manuscript of letters, and he submitted that to Rainer Unwin uh, at, at George Allen and Unwin, and said, "Here's here's the book we've been promising the letters of Tolkien." And uh, Unwin took a look at it and said, "This is this is." 40% too long. I, I, we can't afford the paper and, and customers don't want to spend this much on a book. So I need you to cut 40% of the material out of this book. I need you to get your page count down from, you know, 700 to 400 or whatever the numbers were. Um, and so Carpenter went back and they eliminated some letters. They tried to focus up more on Middle Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to, for, for the first edition. Um, and so what you'll find in this uh, in this new edition, there's a lot more letters restored that are more on the family and publishing and, and other topics to kind of balance out the book to make it a more uh, a more even coverage of Tolkien's life, both in in Middle Earth Legendarium and outside. So, uh, so this new revised edition is actually the original manuscript. So. Harper Collins editors oh, really? went back and and Chris Smith, uh, the editor uh, of the Tolkien line and, and many other things at, at, at uh, Harper Collins uh, was told by Christopher, I don't know how many years ago, five, six years ago, Christopher said, you know, I still have the original draft of letters that we submitted. And so they've been working for I don't know how long to take that draft and put it into publishable form. So this this new revised edition is actually what Humphrey Comforter and Christopher Tolkien actually proposed back in 1979 or so, uh, when when this book proposal was sitting in front of the publisher. So so it actually is edited by Humphrey Carpenter. It is what they originally envisioned for the letters of Tolkien that had to be edited down and is now restored to to the original vision. This is probably the point where we should speculate that. The publisher was too conservative in that estimate and kind of un miss, you know, really underestimated the appetite of the Tolkien fans <laughs> that even way back when. Is that safe to say? I think so. And I think I, I'm I'm hopeful in, in this case as well. They they a, a second question we get that's relevant here uh, all the time is where's the deluxe edition of this new revised letters because they've made deluxe editions of everything else for Tolkien and usually they come hand in hand you get the deluxe you know new illustrated Hobbit and you get the standard illustrated Hobbit they're not doing oh, a deluxe yeah. for this I personally think that's because they're not sure how well this is going to sell and I'm, I, you know in my mind it's like this is going to sell like hotcakes I think there there's a big market everybody wants to see new words from Tolkien on his thoughts on, on so many topics that uh, I think this is going to sell really well. And if you've played around with the the guide to Tolkien's letters on our website, you'll know that there's there's thousands of other letters. So they went from 354 to 508. And those were the letters that Carpenter thought were relevant in the late 70s, right? So we've seen so many more letters come out uh, in the intervening decades that have shown up that he sent to fans that didn't weren't even known to Humphrey Carpenter. So there's wow. probably material for two or three more volumes of the collected oh. letters of Tolkien that are out there uh, oh, that boy. are known to exist. So, so yes, please go out and buy this book, get your friends to buy this book, because if it sells well, Harper Collins will get the message that there is a market for even more letters somewhere down the line. But the, the material in this book is fantastic to start with. Matthew in the chat room uh, actually makes a good point in a, a rhetorical question, which is hopefully this book doesn't screw up the numbering of the letters. And I, you, you kind of you alluded to that, uh, but do you, uh, definitively, are are the letter numbers staying the same? Definitively, they screwed it up. <laughs> so uh, there is, there is um, in the new revised edition, they swapped letters, the, the original letters, 219 and 220. So if you open up your first edition letters, okay. you'll have a 219 and 220. I'll open my book while I'm talking so I can show Got you. Got it what you're seeing okay. here but that's uh, after that yeah. massive massive number 211 it goes on forever yeah yeah this, with, this with is the cute little helmet the numenorean so, helmet that he drew on that i love letter 211 yeah. okay oh wait that's so 219 i don't have it 
I didn't okay, have my so, post-it note on it. Sorry. It says here, uh, letter 219 from a letter to Alan and yep. Unwin, October 1959. Yep. It's only two yep. sentences long. Yeah, exactly. So only two sentences it, long. It, so, so yeah, in your copy, you have 219 is to Alan and Unwin, and then mm -hmm. 220 is to Naomi Mitchison. Yes. Um, and the Alan and Unwin letter was redated. So uh, at some point, an error was discovered, and that letter was actually sent on the 16th of October. Oh. And so, and so for whatever reason, HarperCollins decided to swap those two. So in, in the revised edition, no one's going to be able to see this, but in the revised edition, <laughs> 219 is to Naomi Mitchison and 220 is to Alan and Unwin. So they're, they're short letters, but... The, but, the, but that's the, the, the only bit, change in numbering that they've done that I that I'm aware of. That's I, great. I love to this hear so much. A Cambridge cat breeder had asked if she could register a litter of Siamese kittens under names taken from the Lord of the Rings. She didn't want to name the kittens until she got permission from J.R.R. Tolkien. Think about yep. that for a second, folks. That's brilliant at respect to the author. And he says, My only comment is that of Puck upon mortals. And I'm like, eh. He's, well, I hate to say it, but he's being rather catty right now. Professor Tolkien being <laughs> real snarky, real catty, and I love it. Uh, and he says, I fear that to me, Siamese cats uh, belong to the fauna of Mordor. But you need not tell the cat breeder that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's so juicy, but they did feel the need to reorder it because the date, there was a real error discovered in the date. But, um, on, but you know, only who, on the uh, who on could those... academically argue with that. There's no problem with that academically. It would be smart to change the order then. Well, you didn't you just mention a uh, uh, letter two eleven or something like that that that, that was super long. Um, oh yeah, there mm -hmm. there Famous. are a few letters in in this book that have become uh, monuments to author intent, uh, yes. and that yeah. are cited across. Uh, a ton of other literature, a ton of other scholarship, a ton of other books, a ton of other PhD theses, theses on uh, on Tolkien. Uh, and, and so those have stayed the same. Like, like there's yes, okay. Those numbers are all the same. Like I said, all of the original numbers are preserved uh, from the original edition. So if you're talking about letter 131, which was to Milton Waldman, and which just goes into like, here, let me describe to you in 30 pages what I intend to do with my entire legendary. Uh, it's a fantastic letter going into his creation process. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we were just talking about 211, which is to Rona Beer, who is an American who um, at, at the time, so these are the late 50s, she just sent him like a list of like, 20 questions. I don't remember how many questions it was in her original letter, but she's just like, why did you say bit and bridle? Like, why would the elves be using, you know, a bit in the, in the horse's mouth? And he's like, you're absolutely right. And so the second edition, Lord of the Rings, nope, the bit and bridle's gone. He he removed that from the, uh -huh. the, the, yeah. the, the chapter because he's like, no, elves wouldn't use a bit and bridle. You're absolutely correct. So she just had this fantastic focus on detail and he really... Uh, he 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 warmed to that, and he wrote her letters back with just these long, lengthy descriptions and sketches of what things would look like. And so, those letters, as you said, are just monuments to his creation process, uh, and it, they've been published. Um, is, both is that context? Go ahead. Is that context uh -huh. that you just described, where a fan wrote in a letter and he's like, "Absolutely right, I'll change that." It, it, is that context that he did change it included in? in the letters of Tolkien, the book, like, is there no. editorial context for these letters or are they just presented matter of fact? There's, there's context in the sense of who was this person, right? Cause usually it's just a name and then he just dives right in. And some of them are a little bit baffling except for Carpenter has a little, uh, it's it's indented and it's in uh, square brackets to make it clear it's not Tolkien's words. But Carpenter will often go in and say, you know, this is who's writing to him. This is how Tolkien knew the person, and they had just sent him a letter, and that's what he's responding to. Because otherwise, you're just you know kind of you know coming in out of the dark on, on what he's writing about. But post that, like what what happened after that letter, we often don't get that context. 
in, unless you've done like uh, uh, Hammond and Skull's chronology and the reader's guide. Those are the types of books where we get a lot more in-depth information. And those are from the last decade or so of, of mm -hmm. Tolkien scholarship that are absolutely fantastic, building on what Carpenter and others did back in the 70s and 80s. So, but these letters, the goal of the book is really to give you Tolkien's words with just a minimal amount of, of color to, to help you understand, you know, what, what triggered him to write each letter, if that makes sense. Yeah, the, the Tolkien, uh, there's a question in the chat room. Does TolkienGuide.com host any of, of the letters? And I, let me expand that to, do any websites host these letters? Is there a digital resource where you can just search for, how, you know, did Tolkien write about elves? Give me every letter. Uh, does that resource exist? So that's what we're trying to build at the, the guide to Tolkien's letters, which is on TolkienGuide.com. I don't know how many times we can say guide in one phrase. But <laughs> at TolkienGuide.com, there is a guide to Tolkien's letters. There's links uh, in the header and on the left side uh, if you're on a web browser. But the guide to Tolkien's letters is a database of all the known documented letters and it's growing we we still have over a thousand letters to add to it but we tried to start with the bulk of the most famous well-known ones um oh, and so exciting. those are they those are they're, they're documented to show you know who it was from and to and what the subject matter was and a summary of the letter but we're we're very hyper focused on respecting copyright and fair use and so we don't re reproduce the text of the letters whether they're published or unpublished we have a couple of quotes we think fall into fair use from published letters just because you know they've been out since the 80s and and uh, it's just to give you a little bit of color but for the unpublished letters we don't want to be um pulling in the ire of the estate or the publisher for, for publishing unpublished materials. But, but if they do exist. And what we try and give in for each letter is a pool of reference to, to say, if this letter sounds interesting, here's the page number in chronology. Here's the page number in letters. Here's the Sotheby's listing that had, you know, two paragraphs of the letter shown in a photograph. And so you can do your research from here as a starting point to go to the scattered winds of the web because you've got Tolkien Gateway has some letters uh, excellently documented, auction houses, when they've come up in the last 10 to 15 years, do a pretty good job of documenting unpublished letters. Um, mm -hmm. And those come and go, they're ephemeral. So they show up, they're there for a month or two, and then the auction's over and sometimes the pages don't exist, but there's there's a record of what happened. And so uh, the, the guide itself is built so that you can search for uh, phrases, subjects, or exact words that Tolkien wrote. And it will tell you what letters those are coming from without just showing you the letter itself if that makes sense so we're, we're so trying I, to stay on the correct side of the line <laughs> it's yeah, interesting no. that they haven't uh they haven't allowed the letters to be published i'm on your website right now i've got it up on screen yep so if i'm search if i just put in sauron and galadriel uh it says 14 letters match so there are 14 letters uh, in this uh, uh, that that mentions Sauron and Galadriel, is this uh, is is this your synopsis of the letter, or am I getting an accurate uh, like even though you haven't published the text of the letter, like are the are there only fourteen letters that where Tolkien actually mentions Sauron and Galadriel? So it's. Uh... It's a work in progress. What you're seeing is letters that either mention those exact words or that we as editors of this guide have summarized. Like we might, he might, Tolkien might write the Dark Lord or some other phrase, and then we're adding a tag to that letter to say, he means Sauron. So if you actually found that original letter, it might not contain the word Sauron, but it very clearly does contain reference to Sauron, the Dark Lord, and Galadriel. So that that's the purpose of that. Uh, those search results definitely is to show you, yes, if you're interested in letters that talk about both of these, maybe not at the same time. They may have been completely <laughs> contextually separate paragraphs, but no, these letters should 
you know, they are worth looking into and finding the sources from uh, if you're interested in letters to talk about both of those individuals. Yes. Are uh, when are uh, I, I don't expect that all uh, the new letters uh, have been uh, 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 included on your website yet. The book is uh, due to be published this week and people are getting their hands on it. Um, fans want to know when will the new letters from the new edition of the book uh, be searchable here on your website? Mm. Midnight GMT on the 9th. So Thursday. Oh, wow. That's super specific. I love that. It's <laughs> it, it, it has been a heroic effort, but and we'll probably wow. be doing some editing and some cleanup. But uh, <laughs> on release day, uh, when the book comes out from under embargo, the guide will automatically return those results and show them on, on in the letters guide. Oh, There's that's inter- super cool. An interesting question from the chat room. Uh, or any of the new letters, uh, ones that have surfaced since original publication. And, and I guess that begs the question, have letters popped up from personal collections, people that have received letters, since this book was published and it became a well-known resource? Have people kind of raised their hand and say, oh, I have a really interesting letter with information, new information. Has that happened? There, there are fantastic letters that have shown up in the last five to ten years that that, that, that recently have that recently, yeah. So there was, um, and uh, Nancy Smith was uh, worked for George Ann and Unwin and was an indexer. Uh, she was like a consultant or a contractor that they brought in, and they connected Tolkien with her to try and help him get the index complete for the return of the king back in 1955 for its publication and it they just struggled and it and I, I may be wrong in 55 and it may have been for the second edition um uh, index but uh, uh so she worked with him to like go through the lord of the rings and find words and what pages they occurred on and everything and he loved her draft and he ended up using that and turning that back into the index that was eventually published so all of her notes with his handwritten commentary on it going back to her showed up at auction uh, a couple, like two, three years ago. And so just this fantastic resource. And as you might expect, I think they sold for over a hundred thousand dollars for like 20 pages of, you know, Tolkien's notes. (laughs) It's just crazy because, and, and they're, they're important. And there's other documents like that that have shown up that are incredibly important that did not were not known to carpenter back in the 70s when he was working on this so so those are not in this revised edition of letters and and that's why i'm hopeful there will be a volume two someday because there are well-known well-documented letters that carpenter did not know about so there's plenty of material for a volume two to come out someday as far as you know this now begs the question does this official book, The Letters of J.R. Tolkien, and, and its newly revised edition, are these only letters that are in possession of the Tolkien family and the Tolkien estate? Uh, like, is there anything in this book that, that uh, Humphrey Carpenter and the publishers acquired outside of the family? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's It's a great part of the history of how letters came about. Um, so no, the answer is no. Many of these letters are from, they were sent to fans and family and family friends. And Carpenter put out advertisements in UK newspapers and he sent them to US fanzines. He sent them to the Tolkien Society, the British Tolkien Society, which founded in 69. I think their birthday was yesterday or today. So they're happy birthday, uh, Tolkien Society. Um, so these advertisements he sent out and said, if you ever got a letter from Tolkien, please make a photocopy and send it to me for possible inclusion in my volume. Do not send me originals. And so, and so he got those and he, he put them into uh, the original edition of the Lord of the Rings. And some of those have since shown up on the, the collector's market because those people had sent copies to Carpenter, but they kept the original. And then, you know, those were people who were, you know, 
expands back in the 50s and 60s. They passed on. The estate gets broken up over time. And so, yeah, there are there, there's a very strong market for letters in in the collector's market that are reproduced in Humphrey Carpenter. If you have a letter that was published in Carpenter's book, it's worth so much more than a letter that Carpenter didn't you know, know about in general, if we're just speaking in general terms, because people want, I have letter, you know, 124. That's, it's in my hands. I own a letter that Carpenter decided to put in his book. It's a fantastic feeling to see something like that, you know. Our, uh, good question from the chat. Are most of the auctioned letters recently are they being purchased by private collectors and and not being made available, or uh, or, or uh, do are scholars getting access to these newly discovered letters or newly for sale letters uh, in, in general? Yeah, it's a great question. So there was a phase from the '60s onward where. Uh, archives were trying to build their collections right we have the wade center in the u.s and we have marquette uh, as a library that actually talked with tolkien and bought you know a whole bunch of his manuscripts for the writing of the hobbit and lord of the rings mm -hmm. um so so they wanted to collect letters and they have i want to say the wade probably has 40 or 50 letters that are available for scholars to go in and research based off of i know marquette has I want to say a similar number um, and some photocopies as well of people, fans or you know owners of letters who provided copies to the archives. So, so that was a phase. But my personal communications with the archivist these days is the the collectors market is too hot for us. They just don't have the funds to build to bid against private collectors to keep those letters going into to archives. Um, and so I would say in the last 10 to 15 at basically I, I don't maybe 20 years since peter jackson's movies became so popular tolkien letters have gone way up in price whether it's value or not i can't say but they've gone up in price uh in in auction results if you if you map those out and that's something else we try to do in the guide is provide auction results so you can see this letter has shown up in four dealer catalogs and two auctions and here's what the price did over you know three decades as it's traded hands you can see it tracking up like a hockey stick <laughs> so uh so most of them are going to private hands uh on the flip side i'd say the last 10 15 years most auction houses, when they advertise that they have a token letter, provide pictures of it. So whether or not you get the original, you can read his handwriting. You can, from that auction listing, you can see what the letter said. So you don't have to actually buy the letter to do the research or to have you know a record of what the letter said. So that it, there's kind of positives and negatives in in in, in the situation that's right now. But most token letters, certainly the ones that are material like having, you know, in-depth conversations of lore or family or anything like that are are really expensive price-wise these days. Even letters that are, you know, a few sentences of like, you know, I include my tax check for, you know, please enclose, please find enclosed my, my you know, check for four pounds to pay my bill. You know, those letters are going for thousands of dollars and pounds at this point, just because it's, he held it, has his signature on it, you know, it's, oh. it has provenance. And so it's we're no longer in the days where you could pick up, you know, a, a good provenance letter for a few hundred dollars is 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 probably never going to come back. So I'm, so I archives mean, suffer from from funding issues. They, they can't pay one hundred thousand dollars for a couple pages of a document, you know. So therefore, the secondary market or should we say the private collector's market, for lack of a better term, still has this kind of weird circulation of these things that otherwise mm -hmm. scholars can't access unless somebody says, oh, okay, we're going to donate these to the Huntington Gardens and Library for a special exhibit mm -hmm. for a month. And then they get retracted back into private vault, back into a private ownership state. But I, I do... That, I, that can happen. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, you just said it, right? Uh, you just said that because these go, these are so high valued, they go through professional auction houses. They don't just pop up on eBay anymore. Like auction houses are, are selling these for thousands and hundreds of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Absolutely. So the auction house is taking high res photography and high res scans as part of the auction process. 
So mm-hmm. scholars still have, and fans, still have access to what Tolkien wrote in these letters. So you may not be able to smell his ink, but you can read the letters because you, through the act of, of, of auction. Cliff, uh, Cliff he mentioned um, Marquette, and you've, you've been to Marquette, uh, so maybe you can tackle this question. Uh, no, myself, did... I've never, I've never actually visited the Marquette uh, archives or the campus. Wait, I must you admit, did. I... I was with you. We weren't at Marquette. Sorry, where we were. were... We? we were just uh, in you the suburbs. You were at the Bodleian. We were at the. I don't no, know where you guys were. No, we were in the suburbs of Chicago, um, where they have Tolkien's desk at the. Uh, oh, the Wayne. Um, that yeah, that's the one. Yes, that's the right. We were in. Were we in Joliet, Illinois? I believe. Yes. Or were we in... That sounds right. Schaum- it's in Illinois. I don't remember we were in, what in town Schaumburg. Is, but... I think we are in Schaumburg, Illinois. Mm-hmm. And we were in the far western suburbs. And uh, But that what, that's not Marquette. Oh, Marquette that's not Marquette. Marquette is the next state up in Wisconsin, actually. Oh, well, yeah. we we, yeah. we need to yes. visit there. But So, Cliff, maybe <laughs> you can Absolutely. answer this question. Did, yes. did J.R.R. Tolkien ever really have any inkling... Nice word... Of just how much literally all of his writing would affect the rest of the world, and how valuable his personal letters would be. Did did Tolkien, while he was alive, know that his little letters were worth something? I can't imagine that he. Uh, most of the, uh, I'm sure he was acutely aware of interest in his fiction. He was very, very, very much aware because of the best-selling status of The Hobbit and best-selling status of The Lord of the Rings as well, uh, that the consumer appetite was for more fiction from him. I can't imagine, really, that he would have thought that his personal letters would have been, you know, scoured and, you know, inhaled the way that we do them now today. I can't imagine he would have thought of that. (laughs) He... He sold the the manuscript collection to Marquette for mm-hmm. five thousand uh, pounds back in the sixties, which is you know I, I don't know fifty thousand dollars in today's money, uh, and it was to pay a tax bill. It was like I have a tax bill. Somebody's offering me a sum of money. Sure, that sounds fair. And even up to the end of his life in the seventies. He was getting fan mail to people saying like, hey, I'm going to be in Oxford next week. Can I just drop by and you sign my books for me? And he'd be like, I'll be around. Sure. That's fine. Go ahead. He had, he had no mercurial. I'm going to make, I'm going to sell my signatures. My letters are worth something. He just, he loved that people loved his writings and he wanted to be involved with the fans. And of course we have in our guide, we have probably over 50 secretarial letters at this point, which are, um, they're not signed by Tolkien, but he dictates them and then Joy Hill or someone else would sign it for him and just say, and they're almost all form letters that just kind of say like, if I answer your letter, I'm not going to have time to work on the Silmarillion. So please excuse me, but I just can't, <laughs> you know, they're, they're fantastic little snippets of just like, guys, there's so many of you writing me. I, I, that's all I could do that the rest of my life is just answer your letters and never write another book. Do you want me to write another book or not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love I'm, I'm, it. I'm just on your website, and it, it says uh, mm-hmm. you can filter by uh, uh, letters by J.R.R. Tolkien, but not in letters the book, which is 707. Yep. Does that number get revised now that this new edition is out? Do you have more letters? You have 700 more letters. Mm-hmm listed on your website that weren't in the original book are some of those let those letters that you found and you've documented are they in the new edition so that that 700 some odd number is after that's counting the revised is already being okay. counted in in our guide so there's 700 more on top of what's in revised letters uh, when we did the the input as we got this book in there we had somewhere on the order of 20 to 40 letters already in our guide that we saw were in the revised edition. And most of that, I want to give credit to Wayne Hammond and Christina Skull because their chronology is just fantastically detailed. And they had access to the uh, the George Allen Unwin archives, which is a, a, 
a very good source of letters because they kept everything, maybe not 100%, but there is still an archive that HarperCollins maintains of all these papers from the George Allen and Unwin days because George Allen and Unwin through a couple of steps got acquired into, into HarperCollins. So there is still an archive slash library of the George Allen Lundwin papers that have letters that Tolkien sent. They would stamp them received on this date and they would put it into a file. And so there are these files with just fantastic numbers of letters. And so some of the stuff you'll see in our guide of letters that are letters that we know exist that are not in Carpenter's book are because they're in uh, Skull and Hammond's book. They're in the chronology. And so we can document that they exist. And we're working with you know, archivists around to, to get as much information as we can about these letters to, to, to enter them in there. But so, wow. so yeah. I'm impressed as all get out. Look what I just found. I did a search for Bombadil because we're interested in the bright yellow <laughs> boots and the feather in his hat. And I used this filter that the letter was not in the published, published letters. So right mm -hmm. down here, right down here, the very last entry about Tom Bombadil is a letter from 1967 that was featured on the very popular BBC television series, Repair Shop. I love that broadcast where they find <laughs> old antique things and they resuscitate old antiques that need to be fixed, repaired, refurbished, brought back to life. That is so cool that you went way outside the scope of printed scholarship and found a Tolkien letter that was on a bloody BBC reality show mm -hmm. about repairing antiques. That is so cool. Such that's great. I love it. These letters show up everywhere. We just we were chuckling amongst ourselves. The people who uh, my team uh, are co co scribes, as we call ourselves, a letter showed up on eBay this morning. That we're just like this is brand new. So so we entered a new letter into our guide this morning, and it's it's four or five sentences. It's a woman who wrote in and said, you know, can you tell me why you picked my maiden name? To use in the Lord of the Rings, and she doesn't say what her maiden name is, but we were able to figure it out through uh, through online research. But uh, it was it was one of the stewards of Gondor was her last name, her maiden name before she got married. Um, and so he just wrote back, and he was like, I, you know, he was very apologetic, and he said, I tried to use names that weren't normal people's names. In fact, you might remember there's a letter in the original uh, edition of letters where someone named. Sam Gamgee wrote in and was like, you know, <laughs> were you talking about me? So this is another fan who wrote in and was like, you have my, can you tell me the hit, why you chose this name? And he's like, I, I thought I made it up. I'm, I'm very apologetic. It's just this cool little letter. And it, no one, somebody found it at a yard sale and threw it on eBay literally this morning. And we were able to add it to the guy. It's just, we love finding these things as, as they show up. And this is a constantly growing database yeah. of, of known yeah. letters that just come from all sorts of different sort places, you know? Well, it really let's... does shatter, shatter the illusion that many people may have had that this was it. There's a lot of people mm -hmm. who just aren't in the level of scholarship that some others are, and they might have just assumed, this is it, that's all of Tolkien's letters, and that's why they've responded with such shock and surprise. A lot of people online expressing surprise that this new edition is coming out with all these unseen letters before. And now the fact that you're reminding us that even this morning you've added on brand new things, that they're coming out of the woodwork even a few days from now, and who knows? Another surprise letter of Professor Tolkien might surface yet. So it's a living, breathing, ongoing document, really. And on before, your we, website. before we jump into some of the specific changes, and we'll and we'll, we'll we'll jump into mm -hmm. your PDF in a, in a moment. Uh, a bunch of uh, questions have been coming throughout the show uh, in the in the chat about uh, 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 about um, do filmmakers have access to any of these new letters that have been rediscovered or something like that and and the answer is we have heard and we've been reporting for the last several years that in in the process of of uh these new editions of the fall of numenor and and especially the the uh what was the and book the tale the, na yeah. the nature of middle earth the nature of middle earth mm -hmm. Um, Carl, edited by Hi, Carl. Carl. <laughs> Hi, hello, Carl. 
Mm-hmm. So, so the uh, Carl and and and, so, so, and Carl Hostetter and and, and 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 the producers and the and the showrunners of uh, of Rings of Power did have access supposedly to these unpublished letters, some of which may be included in the new revised edition of this book. So, as far as we know, that if there was n- uh, 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 noteworthy creative notes and uh, and 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 responses in letter form uh, to very specific things that have to do with the second age and have to do with character uh, uh, and uh, you can see in the nature of Middle Earth, Carl Hosseter found a bunch of notes and letters that talk about. Uh, uh, the the nature of elves, you know, how long they live, you know, what their memories are like, what what pregnancy is like for elves. Um, so a lot of this stuff it has been made available to uh to uh the TV show specifically because Amazon has a deal directly with the estate, and as part of that deal, which is separate from the movie deal, which is separate from Embracer, separate from Middle Earth Enterprises, is that. The estate has uh, ha- has a seat at the table when it comes to the the writing of uh, and the development of the show. So you know, as far as we know, it's Simon Tolkien right now. Um, so and, and, you know, whoever whoever the family in the state has access to private letters and notes uh, are uh, you know we have heard that. They're involved in the production of the TV show, and this is where, this is truly where the 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 potential of Rings of Power could be really something special. That the TV show can can do things that nobody expects, and then later on maybe prove it through the letters, and I think that has some fans nervous. Um, but uh, thanks for all uh, all the questions still coming in. Let's dive into some of the tr- changes that uh, that you've identified uh, here on this, Jeremy. Mm-hmm. Um, let me bring up the the, the PDF here. Uh, uh, top top line at the top, uh, you said out of the new letters of of which there's over 150, 40 uh, percent of the new letters are just family letters. 34 uh, mm-hmm. percent are about publishing. Uh, 3% are about media, and, and maybe you can just d- define what that is. And then 23% are other letters. Uh, can you define those categories? Yeah, so so family, we get some some great letters. Um, see if I can spot 38A, one of my... I can't say it's a favorite. It's kind of a dark letter because it's written to Michael Tolkien, um, who was kind of having some troubles and the war was going on since 1940. Um, but it's a it's a favorite in the sense that wow, it's deep and it, it's moving and it's it's a great letter. Um, so 38A is in that family category. So Tolkien wrote to his children. He wrote to. Um, to extended family, uh, cousins, and and friends of his his mother, and things like that. Um, so in the family category, you get things that are talking about health. You get um, uh, child relationships with their mother. Um, so so there was uh, the th- one of the topics in thirty eight A was Michael had um, changed his location. He'd been re redeployed. Um, and he wrote to his his um, love interest first, and his parents, J.R. Tolkien and Edith, found out about it because this girl's parents were friends of theirs and lived kind of close by. And so they said, like, "Oh, we hear that Michael's over here now." And they're like, "You you heard that? What? We didn't know that. We didn't know our own son was there." And so Tolkien writes this letter, and, and there's a couple paragraphs. I, if we have time later, I might read a, a small snippet from it. But he basically writes, and he's like, 
here's how you deal with your parents, right? It's fine. You know, we love that you love this girl and, you know, maybe you won't marry her and don't make these mistakes that I did. And here's some things to think about, but also think about your parents' feelings. And we love that you love this person. We have nothing against her. She sounds great. We, we you know, go for it. Uh, but try and remember your parents while you're doing this and, you know, keep, keep <laughs> us in the loop too. It's, it's not a problem, but it's kind of helpful if you let us know where you are before you let other people know where you are you know, it's a it's a it's it's a funny little anecdote buried in this it's kind of deep letter of a father to his son is saying like you know you're young you're gonna make mistakes let me let me give you some wisdom and it, it's a fantastic so that's kind of a family that's one example of, of family of that category um there's there's publishing there's a lot of information that that was new to all of us so we added a whole bunch of letters to the guide as we're going through this book of you know the background of tolkien writing and saying you know oh i've seen the proofs uh i've made some corrections are they going to be able to reproduce the doors of durin correctly i want you to maybe we can change this here's a dust jacket i'm proposing for the return of the king so there's all this back and forth of trying to get these books made that we get a lot more insight into in in this new edition so so there's the publisher category of, of talking back and forth and it's not just middle earth we we hear about um Sir Gawain and Pearl and um, uh, some of his other lectures that got published. And there's uh, he had the Festschrift uh, um, letters um, uh, presented to Charles William, I think, gets, gets a mention in here. So there's other books that he was involved in that he was dealing with publishers. And of course, we know that um, he tried to sell the manuscript of The Lord of the Rings to a different publisher at one point. That's That was in the original edition of letters. So we, we knew a little bit about that, that he was getting upset with George Allen and Unwin, and they didn't want to do the Silmarillion material. Um, and he wouldn't, he didn't want to do the Lord of the Rings without the Silmarillion with it. And so he tried to take that to a different publisher. And so there's a little bit more background that we learn in, in that phase of, of publishing back and forth of Tolkien, trying to get his baby out there into the world and, and mm -hmm. fighting just the, the commerce of it. And there's, um, uh, so th there's fun stuff like that. And on, on the friend side, he had um, uh, one of my favorite little letters is um, he got a a quick note from Stanley Unwin saying, do you know uh, what you know, uh, oh, number, by the way, uh, number it is, by the way? Um, uh, I wrote it down here somewhere. Uh, 73A. Um, 73. Okay. And so, uh, so, He's writing to Christopher Tolkien about a letter he had just gotten from Stanley Unwin. And he says, um, so Stanley Unwin just mentioned to me that the R. Unwin, so R is the first initial Unwin, that's at Oxford where I'm teaching is actually Rayner, who is the boy who reviewed The Hobbit for me when I was looking to see if I could publish it. Oh, and Tolkien's wow. like... <laughs> oh my God, I have to meet him. So this, you get this little <laughs> glimpse of Tolkien being like, oh, our Unwin that I've been teaching for a couple of days because the, the term just started is actually Rainer Unwin, who was the, the pre-reader for The Hobbit and, and said, yes, we should publish this book. And they became <laughs> lifelong friends. I mean, Rainer took over publishing from Stanley and the George Allen and Unwin. They were, they were super close friends for the rest of their lives, basically. But you, so we get this little letter where he's like, oh, there's this guy, R. Unwin, in my school, and I, I actually know of him, and I should go say hi. This is cute little, you know, thing, snippets that we get in there. Um, I love that. Uh, I love that he was suddenly made aware of that. That's great stuff. And we always uh, yeah. remember that particular story about that little boy who really liked that early draft of The Hobbit, and mm -hmm. in so small an act can the hand of destiny be changed. Just like that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so you asked about the media tab, that little 3%. Um, so, you know, during Tolkien's lifetime, he tried to sell um, the movie rights. I, I tried to is absolutely the wrong phrase. So he uh, he realized there was value and money was always helpful because of taxes and having four children. And, you know, it was just, um, and so he was willing to consider it. And so there's a couple of letters added to what we know of the transactions with uh, Forrest Ackerman, the Morton Grady Zimmerman script. Um, I, I think we put the Ace Books controversy. I don't know if those fall into publishing or media. I have to go back and see which way we counted those. But um, 
Uh, so, so, so yeah, there's a little bit of media for the movie sales and some plays and the BBC performances. Um, there were, there were a couple of BBC, uh, radio shows. Um, Tolkien did some for, uh, like the homecoming of Bjorknoth, Bjornhelm's son, uh, was a performance done. There was a Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I think he was involved in that. There's a letter involved here. I'm going off of memory. So I, I, Apologize yeah, if I'm, I'm a little vague, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm pulling it up. Uh, 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 letter 200A, and you can tell that it's an, a new edition because it's got a, a, a lowercase letter next to it. Uh, again, they, mm-hmm. uh, they they made every effort to keep the numbering system, and then if there was a new edition or an expanded edition, they 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 added. What you can see right here, 196A, 200A. So nothing gets uh, existing gets out of order. But it's interesting. Cliff, September 1957. This is three. No, this is the year after uh, Return of the King had been published. Correct. Um, I 50, believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Fifty six right. is when Return of the King came out. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right. so this is fifty seven, and you were just talking about Forrest J. Ackerman, and it says in this let brand new letter from September of fifty seven. It says uh, in, in in your uh, description here, Tolkien informs uh, Rayner that he had a meeting with Forrest J. Ackerman acting for three persons who were interested in filming The Lord of the Rings. And they have left some drawings and storyboards with him. Tolkien mm-hmm. notes that he liked the drawings by Ron Cobb and will send the material to Rayner once he has time to consider them. He says that at a glance they show more promise than the material contrived by the BBC. And then another uh, another letter oh. three days later, Tolkien describes the ending of the movie script as badly muffed, stating that yes. the only <laughs> thing that would make him happier with the script is cash. Yeah, Ackerman, right. he, he... Go ahead. <laughs> he hated... He hated the... So those three individuals were, in addition to Ackerman, were Ron Cobb, Morton Grady Zimmerman. So Cobb yep. was the storyboard artist, painter... Morton Grady Zimmerman was the script writer, and I know the third person's name, but not off the top of my head, but um, he kind of faded into obscurity. Um, so they had come, I think all four of them came, and they came from the World Fantasy Convention, it was in London, I think. So this, mm-hmm. this that makes they sense. rented a van, and they put like 14 people in the car, and they all drove to Tolkien's house, and they like knocked on his door, and it was kind of chaotic. There's a... I've got some interesting documentation from people who were there uh, at the time. But <laughs> long story yeah. short, I don't know if the name Ron Cobb rings any bells, uh, but I've, well, I've interviewed him. Sli- he's passed away since, but I interviewed him five, seven years ago and talking mostly through his wife because his he was uh, getting on in years. But Ron Cobb was a um, storyboard concept artist on Aliens and Star Wars and The Last Starfighter. And he, he's... In this day and age, he's a very famous Hollywood concept artist, and Tolkien loved his work. And sadly, through all the research that that I and others have been able to do, that material was left with Tolkien, and he sent it back to Forrest Ackerman, and then Ackerman was showing these slides of the movie pitch at different cons and things, and they got lost over the years. So I've worked with the Ackerman estate and everything. The, the, nobody knows where they are, but I would love to see. I, so Ron Cobb has a couple of small sketches that are Lord of the Rings related that I've seen, but this, the material that Tolkien saw is is lost. But it, it, fascinating stuff that was going on in the fifties for for the movie. You know, imagine seeing a Ron Cobb design movie with a better script than Zimmerman ever wrote. But imagine if oh, they had yeah. managed to make that. Oh, I, I, the, the thought just gives me chills. I am so excited you actually got to interview Ron Cobb. Um, mm-hmm. I was never I was never able to do that, even though we tried and couldn't get through. We did our interview with with Uncle Forey. We got yep. the Ringers uh-huh. documentary out with the you know one yep. of the last times somebody interviewed uh, uh, Forrest J. Ackerman, and he spoke mm-hmm. beautifully and glowingly about working with Mr. Cobb and mm-hmm. Mr. Zimmerman as well. But yep. you know he didn't yep. he didn't mention the other person that you also said you couldn't remember. <laughs> not 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 even Forrest Ackerman remembered that guy and didn't mention his name either. But um, mm-hmm. I'm excited that you got to interview Ron Cobb and what a career he really did have. The um, the presentation included 
interesting photographs of Southern California mountains and canyons and some of the mm -hmm. environments in Southern California to impress upon Professor Tolkien some of the places that could represent physical locations. And he was intrigued yeah. by those. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, definitely. It, I looked it up while you were talking. Is John Lackey was the fourth person. And That's like it, I said, the name doesn't mean too much to me or anyone else. Just, yeah, I, I couldn't find too much that he'd be well known for after this. But um, yeah, uh, it was, uh, I want to say Christine Larson, um, I was emailing with a little bit and she made a very valid point of the fact that like Zimmerman and Cobb were like 19 years old. Like th this group of people that was pitching this <laughs> yeah. were not even out of their teenage years yet. And so yeah. Ackerman was literally brought on to add a little bit of of wisdom and and weight <laughs> to this pitch because this was these were literally teenagers just like hey I love this book we should make a movie <laughs> <laughs> the and, and ultimate is... fanboy moment the earliest fanboys yeah. in the 1950s were knocking on his door saying we're ready to do a film That's and this is so one wild. year wild. after the book had published right this yep. is this, so yep. these kids have just read the book their imaginations <laughs> are running wild um uh, the chat room is like hey isn't ron cobb that guy yes ron cobb is that guy yes. he he designed uh the millennium falcon he designed mm -hmm. the delorean for uh time machine for back to the future mm -hmm. he designed a lot of the aliens in all of the Star Wars movies from from the seventies, uh, he is that guy. Like like you, you yep. know the Time Machine, DeLorean, uh, uh, a, a lot of the spaceships uh, in Star Wars. It, he is a legend. So ha, you know before any of those huge blockbusters, his first this might be his first movie effort was like he read Lord of the Rings and was like had sketches and was like i have we have to make this and they, they mm -hmm. went to tolkien himself and tolkien got to see see these sketches and then sent it back hey, oh my tolkien, gosh tolkien thought it was just i mean if you read these letters he's saying and uh, which letter is it that he just rips the script a new one he just goes line by line and he's like oh my god this script is horrible and that's that's in the 81 edition of letters we've known about that one for a oh, while yeah. but uh, but the art he liked i mean the art got him over the script he said the script <laughs> has significant deficiencies but if they do these visuals <laughs> i want this to happen that's basically what he's saying in these letters and and that's that's a compliment to ron cobb right there because he was the only artist the other two were working on the script you know that's right oh the, the zimmerman script was uh execrable <laughs> I, I hate to say it, yes but it really really i think really tolkien was. wasn't used even worse language than that when he was talking uh -huh. about it. and so th th this funny. is this is an important addition again it it, it has it oh, has it was letter 207 by the way thank you yep yep yes uh you know the, the you know to talk talking about um a forest ackerman's pitch with with these artists with ron cobb and stuff uh the up to now for the last 40 years the uh, perspective that most fans have are of the the letter that you just talked about where he criticizes every little detail of the scripts, right? Uh, and and we, we see Tolkien through critical eye, and I'm sure that made sense to put in. But having this new edition where Tolkien is, is just like, I've just had this great meeting. These kids are wonderful. The artwork's incredible. To, to hear him, to hear Tolkien uh, uh, celebrate uh, this th this creativity that that's spawning from his recently published book uh, kind of dulls the blade of that harsh critique, and I think this is where this this new revised edition it it is actually doing better for Tolkien to show that it, he didn't just hate things and he didn't just like things like. Mm -hmm. You know, he goes through these waves. Did you get that sense going through these new letters and these updated that that um, he he did go uh, you know through the wide range of emotions through whatever <laughs> he, oh, that, through his through his whole life. I mean, Tolkien is. I personally get the sense that Tolkien is this never-ending 
optimist and a lot of this comes from his catholicism of just you know there's there's something better coming no matter what happens to me on earth things will be better and he has this optimism you see it in i i wrote an article when rings of power came out just saying like if you look through Tolkien's documented responses, and this this relied heavily on chronology and letters to go through and say, whenever he was pitched, if the BBC wanted to do a radio show, if some fan wrote in and said, I want to do a play of The Hobbit, and all these people, and there's dozens of situations where Tolkien was like, go for it. Like, I, there's going to be issues. I need you to respect certain things. But go, he told Zimmerman to go for it. They, they, he gave the rights through Ackerman to this team to try. They, they had an option. They paid ten thousand dollars or something like that in the fifties, in fifty eight, I think, after this initial meeting. And he gave, he saw this script and he ripped it a new one in letter two hundred seven, and and he still <laughs> gave them the option to say, give it a shot, maybe this will work. So he. He wanted to see his vision brought to life. He he loved fans. He he got hammered with health issues. That's one thing you'll see when you go through this book is almost every new letter. And I, I may be exaggerating here with a bit of hyperbole, but you will see the words, I'm sorry, this letter is a month late. I've been sick with fill in the blank. Play Mad Libs with this. And almost every letter starts like that. It's just this poor guy had health issues and and demands on his time and so many projects up in the air. And he went through two world wars and you get this sense of the, the gray clouds hanging over him. And then you see just the rays of sunshine of just, I'm going to find something good in here. We're going to find something amazing to do. I'm going to, I'm going to keep writing. This book is awesome. And how's the war going in South Africa? <laughs> and oh, well, here's another chapter to keep your spirits up. And oh, you know, my best friend just died. And you know, oh, the back and forth and the the range of emotion and his his turn of phrase just it's it's hard to find a letter where you just like you know, did he write that? That's awesome. There's just a little, you know, a couple of words put together. Even when he's just whiffing off a note to his kids, you know, at, at a moment's notice, like, oh, I just have two seconds. And you're just like, oh, that's so, that's so well worded. His, his use of the English language is, you know, I think underpinning mm -hmm. why we love Middle Earth is just the incredible amount of knowledge. But you see it in, you know, a letter to his granddaughter who just had a birthday party or something like that. It's just mm -hmm. fantastic that it wasn't like he spent a decade owning the Lord of the Rings to be what he thought was perfect. And it took a lot of effort. It's like, no, this guy wrote like that all the time. <laughs> like that's just how his brain works is this fantastic grasp of the English language and like 14 other languages. So and, and know, languages just... he 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 created uh, th oh, this yes. letter at, at the bottom of your document again free at tolkienguide.com 295b part of the new uh revised edition 295b uh in a letter to Donald Swan in 67 Tolkien does not like the calligraphy being made by Samuel Hanks Bryant as filler for blank pages. In The Road Goes Ever On, Tolkien objects to Swan using parts of his tangwar as page decorations. He concludes by saying <laughs> Elvish should be treated seriously Here and he is. doesn't like all the vowel signs scattered around as ornaments. Uh, uh, Don't tell Peter Jackson. So here, uh, I don't know if you can get my camera to be big enough yes. here, but yeah. uh, you see those three dots up above, you know, each of the words that are on there. Uh, yeah, I think Peter Jack was a Daniel Falconer. I don't remember who. No, um, Daniel Reeves. The calligraphy. Daniel Reeves. Daniel Reeves. I had the wrong yes. Daniel. I, I think he may have seen uh, the road goes ever on as as a, <laughs> as an inspiration, but Tolkien did not like that that was not something that he was a fan of no, was like no. I, I put so much effort into tenwar and and you guys are just like slapping like little decorations around like it's wallpaper and uh that's that's a funny letter i, I love and, that and, one it, 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 now you can stuff. understand why tolkien fans are the way they are in the discourse and why why the debates <laughs> are so heated because uh a lot a lot of fans have have adopted this same mentality the same perspective the sense of ownership that tolkien had over everything that he created 
uh, mm-hmm. has tra- the, mm-hmm. the fans have adopted that to, to be like, you can't do that. <laughs> you don't do mm-hmm. that. Like Elvish isn't isn't a decoration. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really glad that he spoke about that with such a specific uh, and and sharp retort about that. I'm really glad he spoke up for that. Um, for academics out there who are watching and everybody in the in the <laughs> chat, it was letter 207 that Tolkien wrote to his publisher, Unwin, of his dismay at the Zimmerman script. But it was actually letter 210 where he wrote back to Forrest Ackerman and shredded bit by bit by bit what the Zernman script con- included. So it's actually both letters 207 and 210 that provide a bit of <laughs> Professor Tolkien's sharp distaste for what the young 19-year-old kid had mm-hmm. written. He calls now, him yep. hasty, impertinent. Let me look at this. It's right here. The, these are juicy words. He is hasty, insensitive, and impertinent. Oh, my. It's no, like I, it's I, I, like <laughs> Paul Giamatti in in the Holdovers movie. It's like <laughs> there's I think there's I think that the the movie Holdovers and the way Giamatti is presenting this stuffy over eloquent professor in this high school. There's a little bit of J.R.R. Tolkien that you know the director and writer is sprinkling in there. Uh, you guys have to see the Holdovers. It's a wonderful film. I digress. Sorry. Well, and as you were talking about that, I, I brought up to, uh, 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 Jeremy's uh, uh, cheat sheet of changes, uh, and and there there oh, I love you, it. You go from two hundred five B to two twelve A. So I just wanted to be clear for for people who, who are going to TolkienGuide dot com. Uh, this document, this PDF, uh, is documenting the the changes. So so two uh, let, uh, Cliff was just reading from letter two hundred seven and two ten. But that's not listed here because they are unchanged. But you're saying, mm-hmm. am I am I right to 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 see that every letter that you mention in this PDF, which is free at TolkienGuide.com, these are all the changes, just the changes. These are we're just documenting what's changed here. So yeah, there's there's two different types we mentioned way back at the beginning of the stream. So there's 154 new letters which are documented here to describe what's in them. Uh, and then there are 45 letters that have material restored. And in this PDF, all we mention is the new material. So we don't summarize the entire letter. We just say a paragraph was added that mentioned this and that. So um, th- the goal here was not to you know, write a uh, Cliff's notes for the entire, sorry, Clifford, <laughs> to, to not write a little cheat sheet for the entire book. The goal here was just to say, as you're go- these are letters to pay attention to if you're familiar with the 1981 edition, because you're going to find new material. And some of it's subtle, especially for the letters that were changed. There might be a few sentences or a paragraph restored in the middle of a 10 page letter. And so if you're just skimming through the book, you're like, oh, I know this letter. And you just flip a couple pages and you go on with your life, not realizing that there's a paragraph inserted in the middle. So that's what this document was intended to say. Oh, put a little extra time in the letter 187. There's material that's been added to it that you, when you start reading it, it'll sound like you know it already, but there's 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 more to it. So keep going. Um, 131, everybody asks for it. 131, that's uh, like the Prancing Pony podcast goes to that letter in almost every episode. It's a fantastic overview because Tolkien was writing to a friend and saying like, this is what I envisioned for Middle Earth. And it was it's a hugely long letter and it's like 40% longer now. So Humphrey Carpenter excised wow this massive middle section where Tolkien wrote in book one of the Lord of the Rings, here's what happened in book two, here's what happens. And then in book three, the the fellowship goes off and does his other stuff. And so it's, it's this from Tolkien's mind, you get like three or four paragraphs for each of the six books of the Lord of the Rings describing. And then he goes on and he's like, and here are the 14 other things that I want to publish the children of Hurin and Baron and Luthien and all these other, he, he just starts listing them out and how they interrelate to each other. And that's all now in letter 131. So go check it out. It's, it's, oh, there's wait, so much that's more juicy. in there. Now. That is so cool. Just like professor Tolkien said, um, it is difficult to say anything without saying too much. <laughs> yeah. Exactly the, 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 the exactly chat the way room he is said freaking it out right now. The chat room is freaking <laughs> out right now. Did you really just say that? 
forty percent longer on one thirty one. Yeah, it's yes. very exciting. It's very uh, exciting uh, to me. Uh, th- like this, this footnote in your in 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 your PDF, which just is uh, is is a track changes document, basically. Uh, it's, it's such <laughs> it a is. tiny little paragraph. You're just like uh, it's highlighted in green, though. It says significant material is restored. Forty uh, significant. I'm 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 trying to be concise here. All right. Well, <laughs> let, let's let's deep dive on one thirty one, maybe. Uh, 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 and and let let, let me pre- start with this. Uh, it's cited by all the podcasts all the time. You may have seen mm-hmm. this image. Uh, uh, I created this in the in, in lead up to uh, uh, Rings of Power. Uh, Tolkien is, it writes in letter 131, I had a mind to make a body of more or less connected legend ranging from the large and cosmo- cosmogonic, <laughs> I don't even know that word, cosmogonic? Cosmo- cosmogonic to the level of romantic fairy story, but li- linked to a majestic whole and yet leave scope for other minds and hands wielding paint and music and drama. A lot of this uh, quote is used to justify all of these adaptations and expansions and not just rings of power not just the uh you know five five new movies potentially with warner brothers uh yeah. not just the return to moria video game the golem game all these video games that go tolkien there he is in letter 131 what does what does it actually mean Leave scope for well, other minds and hands, wielding paint and music and drama. That's what movie making is. It's paint and music and drama. That's what video games are. Paint and music and drama. He specifically calls out these art forms of movies, TV, and video games, mm-hmm. uh, saying but this also, is where but also, it's going. Every, but, but this major context, which you're mentioning, this major supporting mental construct that everybody can take hands of different clay, paint, digital, whatever art artistry you want to take to an adaptation. You guys have always forgotten and have n- not mitigated the next word that he says after Tolkien proclaims this lofty idea, he actually mitigates himself and says, mm-hmm. absurd. He says one simple word, absurd. And everybody mm-hmm. takes that out of context and forgets that the original notion is that Professor Tolkien is admitting this is a bit youthful and a bit overreaching even for me to have thought mm-hmm. that it could do that, that it could spin that far and become that adaptable by other hands. Everybody keeps mm-hmm. forgetting that one word, right, Jeremy? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and the word absurd... Uh, is is used uh, too aggressively because the uh, the word absurd I believe is is used uh, immediately after a very specific uh, mention. You know, I had this mind of of creating this thing absurd. It, it was crazy, but then he actually did it right. So uh, yeah. it's it's crazy that one letter one thirty one might be the most important letter ever published from Tolkien, the most cited letter ever published, and and the most debated letter uh, letter ever published. And here we are in this new book, it's 40% longer. Uh, Jeremy, what is does that 40% include? You just mentioned that it's ex- expanded descriptions, but is, is there uh, any more signs of in author intent in this expanded 131? No, it's a great question, and and not really. It's so well, I'd say no. Um, what Carpenter did when they had the um, the Rainer Unwin demand to reduce this book in length, uh, when they went from first draft to to publishable draft, was they went through they deleted letters, and in this particular letter, there's there's a significant chunk in the middle where Tolkien summarizes the Lord of the Rings book by book, and there's some different i mean he's going off of memory and he's he's shortening things um to us at this point it's fascinating but to readers in 1981 because of page length putting 
three pages of this book of letters, which is summarizing a book that everybody's read at that point, because Milton Walton hadn't read the books. So it was essential for Milton to get a description of what's in the Lord of the Rings, but to us, it wasn't. Now, seeing this lengthy description of how Tolkien envisioned the Lord of the Rings book by book and structure is very fascinating, but it, it wasn't necessary to the first edition of letters. So it's not going to change the authorial intent paragraphs that he was going in with other minds and hands and other stuff. This is, this is a big chunk in the middle where we get to see Tolkien writing a three page summary of the Lord of the Rings and what he thought was important and what interactions. he. So, so that's critical and it's many pages. And then at the end, there's a similar chunk where uh, he says, um, trying to find the section here, um, he, uh, it's not the right one. Here we go. So uh, he gives a list of, oh, by the way, we've been talking about what I have and what might be publishable. So at the end of the letter is a lengthy, bulleted, numbered list of here's all the material that I have. So again, fascinating for us to go through and see what Tolkien called things and how he interrelated them and a description of the music of the Ainur and things like that. He's, he's, he's got, again, these summaries that are fascinating to us, but to someone in 1981 who had just bought the Silmarillion and had been reading the Lord of the Rings for two decades wasn't essential. So I don't think there's something essentially changing or going to suddenly rock the world in 131, but there's a lot of fascinating detail that's being added to it to, to expand how Tolkien saw his legendarium, but not in the sense of talking the other topics that he, he wrote to, to Milton, if that makes sense. Which is why when I summarized 131 in my little cheat sheet, I didn't say like, this is earth shattering. It's like, no, there's significant material added that expands upon stuff we already know, but it's fascinating to see how Tolkien wrote about it, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I found uh, time.com, time life, which is probably a, an authoritative uh as any, uh, somehow has published the uh, original uh, version of the book, not the updated. Uh, and it, it says at the end of this letter, uh, 131, it is not possible, even at great length, to pot the Lord of the Rings in a paragraph or two. Little did Tolkien know that there would be DVD uh, covers that you had to synopsize the epic, <laughs> create a two paragraph <laughs> synopsis. Um, it was, he oh, says, gosh. he writes, uh, Tolkien writes, it was begun in 1936 and every part has been written many times. Hardly a word in its 600,000 or more has been unconsidered. The placing, size, style, and contribution to the whole of all of the features, incidents, and chapters has been laboriously pondered. I do not say this in any recommendation. It is, I feel, only too likely that I am deluded, lost in a web of vain imaginings of not much value to others, in spite of the fact that a few readers have found it good on the whole. Yeah, uh, so at the end of that paragraph, he says... I have finished it. It's off my mind. The labor has been colossal and it must stand or fall practically as it is. And then Carpenter puts dot, dot, dot. And then the next paragraph is that is a long and yet bald resume. Right. And then the letter yep. continues. So nice. that dot, dot, dot is 20 paragraphs restored. So between those two paragraphs, that little dot, 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 there's a yep. 20 paragraph description of the Lord of the Rings in the new edition of the book. There, it's funny. A little tiny ellipses can stand for so much. Oh, it does. It does. And I, I, there's one letter I've been working with the estate for a while, and it's one of the um, Dick Plotz letters. And um, it, um, so the estate gave me permission to quote from it in my Oxenmute paper a few months ago that's still unpublished. But they told me, they're like, you know, oh, this letter is going to be published in the revised, you know, Carpenter, which at that time I hadn't seen. And then the revised Carter. Carpenter comes out, the section that I was allowed to quote from is still dot, dot, dot. I'm like, oh, we got to get this whole, it's important. That was, it was a fun paper to do and it's a fun topic. And it is, it, you know, it's still got the little ellipsis that says, you know, material has been removed, you know, so there, there's still wow. so much of that in the revised edition. So let, let's do a restored, restored someday, please. You know, oh, I, I see people edition. in the chat calling it the extended edition of letters i'm i'm all down <laughs> for that we should eventually have a unicorn edition of the letters where it's, it's yeah. just every, well that you're achieving that you yeah. are helping us achieve that 
actually. We're, I, I, we're I, trying. I know, yeah. I, I know it's a lot of bloody work behind the scenes. And to, to, to admit here on the show that when the book is out, you're ready to drop everything at that exact time and make it all available <laughs> for everyone. That's so bloody ambitious and remarkable. I, I say yes. my hat's off to you. My, my <laughs> hat is off to you because well done. Really hard work. Really well Clear. done. It's been a team effort. I, I, I yes. don't know if there's any uh, uh, updates to this paragraph, but again, uh, we're still on letter 131 and why this is the mm -hmm. most important letter he ever wrote. Cliff, can you can you talk about this paragraph? Letter 131 mm. is the paragraph where Tolkien writes, I dislike allegory, mm -hmm. yet any attempt to explain the pur or purport the myth or fairy tale must use allegorical language. Talk a little bit about Tolkien's view on allegory it could, because it, 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 it is sourced from letter 131. Allegory versus applicability. Um, I Let's see now, and, and Jeremy, you can help. Um, and a special yeah. shout out to Jordan in the chat. Jordan from a long expected soundscape. He's joined Matt, Nerd of the Rings, and Carl Hostetter, and the Wonder of Tolkien. We have such a big, wonderful crew of uh, Tolkien um uh scholars and content creators and they're all here with us jeremy so mm -hmm. let's do this right the whole concept of applicability versus allegory did that come directly from a specific letter or was that from a chapter of the carpenter biography where humphrey managed to get to that conclusion based upon all of his research well i, this is... I think there are go ahead, go ahead jordan no, no. You, you, I think you there, there's multiple letters that talk about this, yeah. um, and so uh, and and again, I'm racking my brain. It's you know, it's been a long weekend uh, trying <laughs> to remember which letter. So we, I might be able to come up with some as we go on, and I'll drop notes in as we continue okay. the conversation. But um, but yeah, it's you know, he, he was very much against allegory, and yet he wrote, um, you know, the the tree and leaf uh, the his, his oh. essay and and his his short story um and leaf leaf by niggle yes leaf yes by niggle exactly yes. which is like allegory yes. with a bow and nicely tied off at the top of it and so uh it, it's he he understood what it was and he used it when it was appropriate um and i there, there's, I think, plenty of textual evidence in the letters, and um, that uh, that he was not doing allegory with Lord of the Rings. That was not his goal. He could do it, and he did do it elsewhere. And that was not. He, that's what he's trying to say in his letters: is you know, this is not allegory. This is this is something else completely. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, well, the uh, he says, I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations and always have done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect his presence. And that explains a hell of a lot of the friction between Jack Lewis and Tolkien with the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> that goes a long way to explaining that relationship. And uh, Professor Tolkien continues by saying, quote, I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability to thought and experience of readers. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory but one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purposed domination of the author unquote let me let me add to that with a new quote from the new yes book. oh juicy so um <laughs> juicy so this is his description of the end of the sixth book right um i'll just read a few sentences because i'm sure i'm getting a little ahead of the embargo on this um review copy but uh oh meow so, meow meow They'll be fine. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> to Bilbo and Frodo, the special grace is granted to go with the elves they love. An Arthurian ending in which it is, of course, not made explicit whether this is an allegory of death or a mode of healing and restoration leading to a return. Right? So he's summarizing mm -hmm. right there that mm -hmm. he's intentionally not making it explicit whether this is an allegory or just the the story of what needs to happen for for uh for bilbo and frodo so you know in this same letter where he's saying i despise allegory he's saying 
I left it kind of up in the air and it's not explicit and it's kind of up to the reader to decide whether this is an allegory of death or something else. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some good stuff in 131. So, so jump to so. it. There, um, <laughs> on, it, on uh, letter 203, let me bring this up. I, I'm wondering, uh, did they figure out uh, what that illegible uh, word was in letter two o three. Let me put up put up on screen. This is the yeah, old yeah. version. Uh, letter to uh, Herbert Shiro in, in November fifty seven. So again, this is this is one year after Return of the King finally got published. Uh, Tolkien writes in fi- nineteen fifty seven. There is no, and I believe that is uh, Tolkien's uh, uh, italicized no symbolism or conscious allegory in my story allegory of the sort of five wizards equals five senses i hadn't even considered that is wholly foreign to my way of thinking there were five wizards and that is just a unique part of history to ask if the orcs are communists is to me as sensible as asking if communists are orcs (laughs) i love it so obviously he got a fan letter (laughs) In 1957, uh, uh, in the early days of the Cold War, asking if the orcs are communists. And Tolkien's response is, uh, (laughs) it is Mm -hmm. not sensible. Uh, Tolkien uh, writes in letter 203 that there is no allegory, does not, of course, say there's no applicability. There always is. And since I have not made the struggle wholly unequivocal, sloth and stupidity among hobbits, pride and blank among elves. And of course, uh, grudge and greed in dwarf hearts, folly and wickedness among the kings of men, and And treachery treachery and power lust even among the wizards. So there uh, is, I suppose. So that was my question. Did they figure, do they have an educated guess or did they figure out what that illegible word was? So I, I'm going to put this in my notes for later. But so the book did not change two or three at all. It still says illegible, but all right. the word the word is because it was found and it's in our guide in the summary. If you go to two letter two or three, Ooh. Um, if you uh, go in there, it is. Uh, I'm trying to line up. Okay, so the sentence is sloth and stupidity among hobbits pride and escapism among elves grudge and greed and dwarf hearts so the the word is um escapism interesting escapism escapism how oh, how, 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 okay how come to i understand that? i understand he's talking about the elves escaping their fate of going to valinor uh-huh. and returning to the undying lands in an attempt to maintain deathlessness, uh, to maintain that the, the you know the slowing of time, which he described was the major s- sin of the elves, was their was their avoidance of the destiny of their leaving Middle Earth to go to the Undying Lands, and instead yep. using powers to maintain worldly domains of timelessness and deathlessness. That's that's right. I think that must be a big clue towards that uh, a, a mental approach that he had don't you think yeah exactly am i, yeah. I, I, I am i am i reading this right again, again so it, apologies if it's a stupid question but in this letter 203 uh, uh i mean that's really interesting that he just buckets every race uh in in middle earth but and he does it saying <laughs> under applicability like he says there's no allegory but these descriptions say there is applicability and here are things to apply to these races so so Mm -hmm. this is what these are the core core things of each of the races am i reading this right like the core foibles their greatest foibles of each race the uh, the achilles heel of each one perhaps that is interesting I mean, yeah, and it, you know, it's like hobbits are sloth and stupidity, right? So, does that ex- does that describe Frodo, right? Not, Not at, at all. all. 
exactly. So he's not saying hobbits are sloth-like and stupid. That's that's not what he's saying in this letter at all. So you know, don't don't take that to be buckets that these races fall into. But I certainly think he is saying that there are comparative. If you compare hobbits as a whole to elves as a whole. These are some of the differences that are just going to jump out at you as as you know what's going on. And Tolkien saw himself as a hobbit, right? <laughs> he described himself that way in multiple interviews. Um, it's hard to picture him as slothful, but uh, or stupid. You know, it's like, I don't know. He, so so no, he's not using this as an allegory and saying that this is what these races are, right? That's that, that's certainly not what he's the aiming for here. The, the chat the chat room says uh, 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 better than me. Uh, 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 Tolkien Wonder says <laughs> these are the root sins made manifested in action. Uh, and that's, so that's an incredibly point. well phrased. Thank you. <laughs> the root sins made manifested in action. Um, and, and this gets me excited now about where Rings of Power could go. Because if the, if the writers of Rings of Power can, uh, can look at letter 203... Uh, there you have it. These are the root sins of the different races. And Sauron's got a lot of corrupting to do. He's got 20 rings to make and distribute and corrupt. Uh, and, and As he so, seeks to order the world into the way that he envisions is the right way to order the world. But that, combined with his unending pride, becomes villainy and becomes control. Uh, control mm -hmm. and the destruction of free will of others because of Sauron's desire to order the world to his means and to his methodology. It's it, yeah, uh, there is potential in rings of power to go into much more interesting thematic places. It remains to be seen if they will do it. And Tolkien ends this letter. The last sentence again is fascinating. He says, but I should say if asked the tale is of Lord of the Rings is not really about power and dominion. The tale is not really about power and dominion. That only sets the wheels going. Mm -hmm. It is about death and the desire for deathlessness. Big time. I keep mm -hmm. coming back to that. You know, when I bumped into one of the showrunners on the Amtrak train, and he said, <laughs> what are you looking most forward to? What are you really looking forward to in the Rings of Power? And I quoted that exact quote. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he rubbed his hands together, and he looked up the ceiling, and he said, I think we got you covered. And that's all that he said without breaking his DNA. But yeah, I, <laughs> he, he literally asked me, the guy from the one ring.net, what I most wanted out of a new Tolkien TV series. And the only thing I could think of that was most important to me was a thematic power that is spelled out in that particular statement that the professor made. There is so, and it's a very holistic even though it's not reductive to say that it just minimizes it down to these this you know one step two step process it's not like that but it really does open up a very big holistic thematic door but i think it has to be a foundational really foundational aspect of what they're doing building the tv series and if they succeed in doing that regardless of broad interpretations and very you know playing fast and loose with the timeline and the rules of the world and the chronology. Okay, fine. We can tolerate all of that. As long as they stick to that foundational power of that them thematic uh, construct. And I, I hope that they do. This, this, this they do. short letter, again, uh, I, uh, Jeremy has said this a few times in this conversation a few different ways, but <laughs> even the smallest of letters can be so insightful into into Tolkien's again this this letter right here letter 203 is 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 small it's two paragraphs uh eight sentences mm -hmm. but uh you can take away so much from it and give you a perspective of of everything uh that is is has been written and is to come uh we've been talking about this for for a couple hours so i, I just wanted to give you one more uh, uh opportunity to, to to call out uh, something special in this revised edition. Again, if you go to TolkienGuy.com, uh, 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 Jeremy's put together and his team have put together this amazing PDF of 
of uh, uh, all the changes and just the changes. Um, but is there uh, what for you, Jeremy, really stood out as uh, as like, oh wow, this is this is incredible. Um, well, it's hard to pick one. I, I'm going to go to 254A, a uh, letter to Christopher from 1964. Where he just went on about uh, church and family and marriage. And so I'm trying to remember timeline on when Christopher got divorced from his first wife. So I think there was, there's a lot of family drama going on in the sixties and it's, it's another one of those deep letters. And again, there, there's so many instances I can point you to of fascinating tidbits of publishing the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit that I'm fascinated by and middle earth details that kind of slip into 131 and other places. But these glimpses that we get of just total raw, heartfelt family letters that are in here are just, they're, they're, they're incredible that, you know, we're, we're given this glimpse because there's a there's a lot in the family archives that we will never see. The family has just blocked off huge chunks. They just it's personal and they don't want to do that. And yet Christopher in the 70s was willing to have this letter go. They edited it out for space, but they're now restoring it. And it's the mm. family's okay with us seeing a little bit more behind the door. And I know Tolkien was completely against, you know, source analysis. And he's quoted many times as saying, you know, the biography of an author is useless for interpreting the author's writings. Like he, he was absolutely against that. Like the Plimmers interviewed him for a magazine article in the sixties. And he was just like, I don't want to do this. He did it. Uh, it, was, it was kind of the promotional tour. I need to sell more books, right? I need the income. I'm retired now, so I got to sell more books. But I really don't get why people keep asking biography. He would talk for, you know, oh, you want to talk about elvish writing systems and the der derivation of language, and you want to know what kind of hats did the Numenorians wear? It's like, oh, sure, I'll do that. But the personal stuff he was a little more reticent about. And yet in these letters that the family's letting us see, we're, we're really getting a glimpse into his family and what, what meant to him, what was so important to him, you know, in, in these uh in these years where the only glimpses we've had really are fan letters right you know there's there's huge chunks of of this book that's family related in the in the revised restored edition here so um you know I, one of the questions the group of us that was working on this where we were just having fun talking about was you know oh, there's a whole bunch of letters restored that are family and yet if you just look at the raw counts it's like over 50% of them are to Christopher. Well, Christopher was helping edit this book. So one, they had access to all of his letters. And two, he was aiming to be more Middle Earth related. And he was the one with Tolkien that was really, you know, Priscilla and Michael and John didn't really talk Lord of the Rings like throughout their whole lives. Christopher was the one that was just bouncing ideas off of. So it's appropriate that those letters are in there. But we do get some additional letters from John, from Priscilla, not from two, John and to Priscilla that help us see a little bit more of this this outer family that isn't just hyper focused on oh you're a fan of Middle Earth here's more Middle Earth right we we, we get a, a better picture and I personally disagree with Tolkien I think the biography is interesting and helps us understand where Middle Earth came from right the leaf mold that Tolkien was building from wasn't just uh, Old English and Old Norse and Old Icelandic legends that he was mixing and, and taking ideas from. He was pulling from his religious experience and the loss of his mother and World War One and all these other things that you know John Garth and and other scholars have documented. But his letters really give us this glimpse of the person who came up with these ideas. So that's my long answer to your very short question. And it's interesting that uh, he really didn't want to talk about himself in interviews and he, he didn't like the idea of biographies and he really didn't like the idea of, of using uh, the author biography to read more into his, his narrative because after his death, it was, a, it became the family business and only C Christopher held an iron fist of like, it's only his. Like oh, Christopher was the only one that was allowed to 
to publish new works by Tolkien for the next 40 years, you know, uh, like, you know. I, I might disagree with the Iron Fist characterization. I think, I think the other children in the family want it. Like, this was like, Christopher is your baby. Go for it. We love it. I mean, Priscilla lived in Oxford and hosted annual get togethers for the Tolkien Society. She invited them every Oxford moot. They would come into her living room and she would serve tea and they would sit there and they would chat about her father. And she was involved, but she was not a book editor, right? Like Christopher was actually a scholar in the same vein as Tolkien. He studied very similar topics. He went to university. He published books on, um, you know, King Heidrich's saga and other things. Um, uh, he was an author. And he talks a bit, I mean, there's um, um, the great tales never end. I don't have my copy right at hand, but the, the fest strip for Christopher that came out from Bodleian last year uh, was uh, uh, Vincent Ferry went through and, and talked about like Christopher Tolkien, the author, right? He's not, we all picture him as this editor that's just spitting out his, he's, he's going through and making presentable his father's papers, but no, he's an author in his own right. He, he, mm -hmm. he wrote. And that is important. And so I think from your characterization of him taking over the estate, I mean, uh, J.R. Tolkien wrote in the 60s, like, my son, Christopher, is going to be my executor. Like, that is that is the plan. The family's on board with it. He wants to do it. I want him to do it. He's seen all my papers. And and so it's, it's I maybe as Christopher was getting older and the grandkids and others are involved in the estate, I have no idea the dynamics that are going on in there. But... Um, but I, I have no sense that there was like this iron fist. I just have this sense of this this wellspring of love from Christopher just being like, I've been handed 4,000 boxes of papers that my father spent from 1957 until his death trying to organize, right? The, the amount of new material that Tolkien wrote in those years was tiny compared to what he wrote from 1914 until Lord of the Rings was published in 1954. You know, it's, it was all revision and editing and trying to pull things together and trying to make things make sense with each other and then revising things because of the ace copyright controversy. He had to go back and rewrite the Lord of the Rings a little bit and fans were writing him letters and he was just, he really struggled to write in those ensuing years. And Christopher was totally on board with you know, I'm going to see if this is possible. My father tried and struggled and asked me to do this. And so I'm going to make it my life's work to try and do what my father asked me to do. You know, it's so heartfelt. It is indeed. And it's one of my favorite aspects of that father-son relationship mm -hmm. is that Christopher was willing to take on the stewardship of his father's work. And I'll never forget it might be an apocryphal story. It might be not true, but I always fall back on that wonderful story of Christopher packing up mountains of boxes, legal boxes and full of documents and scribbled parchments and driving in an old station wagon to the south of France to take up a new residence and to start working out the job of editing what would become later on the History of Middle-Earth series. You know, mm -hmm. I just love that story about, you know... they had. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. They had they had a whole barn in South in South England. I don't remember where he was living. Where uh, Guy K came to help Christopher, and they put the Silmarillion together. The the first version that got published. Yeah. Um, it was a it was an entire building's worth of papers, and they had tables and desks and everything spread out and trying to make sense of it. And they did. They they gave us the published Silmarillion. But then, yeah, Christopher's like. I need to move to France. And partially that was us. I'm not pointing to four of us or three of us particularly, <laughs> but the fans would not leave Tolkien alone. The fans would not leave Christopher alone. And so the move right. to South of France was like, yeah, we're going to get some peace and quiet. I'm going to pack up this entire barn. I've also heard the station wagon story. I, I have no reason to disbelieve it. <laughs> That's and my then, favorite story. Yeah, it sounds exactly. apocryphal and silly. I just love that story. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I can't, there's no way that I can imagine him just being like, oh yeah, throw it in the moving truck. I'll see you on the other side. You know, it's like, <laughs> this is like, exactly. it is, it is 
it is his father in paper form. And so he would have been like mm. babying that from one house to the other, if, you, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Well, so, my, so my, yeah. My, my final question about this new Letters of J.R. Tolkien, which, which is uh, releasing this week. Um, the, there's still an embargo. This week in the UK. This week in the UK. Uh, and you can yep. pre-order Next it week everywhere. In the US. Uh, yep. Buy it, yep. uh, buy it locally if you can. Uh, buy it physical because you saw both of these guys on this show have have earmarked and post-it notes all over the books. <laughs> this this is a reference document as as much as anything. Um, uh, since you're doing a fine tooth comb, I'm curious: uh, are there letters about Tolkien's perspective on fandom and fans? Well, there always have been, yes. So he's published some. Um, there's uh, letter 276 has more material added to it. That was one of the Dick Plotz letters where um, he just goes, in, that was right around when Ace was publishing the, um, what we bootleg. call the pirated editions, the bootlegs, the the, the controversial unauthorized, the, 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 the editions. And so he went into a, a bit more link there about what was going on and asking like, can you pass the word around to other fans and, and try and get them to not buy this Ace book? And uh, there's a few other letters where he, uh, uh, Nan Scott was a woman in the U.S. who had written to Tolkien and said, there are these Ace paperbacks. And they started correspondence. And she actually wrote to Donald Wolheim and said, like, this is wrong, what you're doing. And then that actually is one of the things that Tolkien thanks her for. And one of the new letters that we see is uh-huh. your pushing on this to ace books to donald willing the editor push help move this over to where the situation has been resolved and thank you so much for doing that um so yeah i mean there's those types of fan interactions and then i'm trying to remember if there's other letters in the late time that they didn't focus too much i mean especially because they're publishing this book to the fans uh, I've seen letters where he's just like, oh, God, please leave me alone. Right. <laughs> but those are the family. And those are not the type of letters that are in this edition of the book, because those are the people who are going to be reading the book and they don't want to turn off <laughs> too many fans. So, so those letters exist. I don't think I can recall any letters in here well, th- there where are... he's like, like railing on fandom. Um, but but you he's a polite see, guy. Uh, I mean, my, my we, deplorable we, cultist. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. He really did. Uh, you, I mean, we we just talked we just talked about that short letter where where he's responding to a fan letter, you know, asking if orcs are communists, right? So there are a lot of responses. <laughs> maybe not talking about fans, but you can tell, uh, you can tell in his replies here in this book, uh, that he's responding to fans genuinely you know and being yeah, yeah. as articulate and kind as possible but you can tell his his, his attitude comes mm-hmm. through on, on the page no matter what well thank mm-hmm. you so much for spending all this time and thank you so much for for talking oh, yes. comment and like doing the work and and your amazing team to to comb through every tiny little detail that has been updated mm-hmm. on this and and documenting all, all the letters oh. that pop up <laughs> it's it's my pleasure our pleasure i'm speaking for a team here uh, if you don't mind my plugging on friday we're going to do something similar we're having a live stream after the book is published where we'll be going into a little more detail oh. um the four of us so um trotter mr underhill on the trail and myself um so the the uh the, the leads of the team uh for the Tolkien's guide to Tolkien's letter so if you don't, we will be doing more. We have we have more letters we're going to dive in. It'll be published so we can read more excerpts and, and we'll be having a lot of fun with that. The guide will be live um, so we can actually do some more walkthrough of new features and functionality that are coming up in, in, in the online guide to Tolkien's letters, the database that you can search. So, so that's going to be a lot of fun. But it's been awesome being here with you too. You're very easy to talk with and i've had so much fun and we've gone all over the map on tolkien's letters and tv shows and movies and it's it's fantastic i always love talking with you guys it's absolutely a pleasure sir you are you know you have elevated our conversation so greatly today and you've you and your team of people deserve a great deal of acknowledgement and i like to say that about the hard-working volunteers at the one ring.net as much as i'd like mm-hmm. to say it about the good folks 
volunteering their time and working with you on this amazing project. It's super cool, and it will be not just in an academic way, but for even a, a reader who's casual, it would be a really, really useful tool to check out things and see the differences between the editions. Um, I'm so excited. This coming Friday is going to be a really great experience. Thank you for plugging that. Everybody, um, follow Jeremy. He's going to tell you what accounts exactly where to follow. <laughs> tell, tell people where to plug in. Absolutely. So, I mean, easiest... Uh... YouTube and Facebook, Tolkien Guide, actually almost everywhere is Tolkien Guide, although I am um, I'm on hiatus from whatever Twitter is calling itself nowadays. The, art, the, the account is there, but I am intentionally yeah. not doing anything on it. But, uh, yeah, Blue, exactly. <laughs> I moved to Blue Sky personally. It's very small. Uh, I have invites if anybody wants some. Um, oh, yeah. Just hit me nice. up through some channels because um, it's, it's a small little close-knit community that's growing, but there's a lot of Tolkienists there already. Uh, and I would love to have more. Uh, so that's mm. kind of, it's the most Twitter-esque that I've found that I'm just enjoying um, for for short little interactions with, with people directly. Uh, but it. yeah, Tolkien Guide is our channel on YouTube. Uh, the site, TolkienGuide.com. Um, Facebook is, the, the page is Tolkien Collector's Guide there. I am Tolkien Guide. That's my account name on Facebook. So you can find me in just about any social media. Uh, and then the rest of the team is uh, Trotter. You can find him most places under the, the Trotter name. Mr. Underhill is uh, primarily helping me out on Instagram and on the trail just launched our Reddit sub, which is Tolkien Guide. It's um, so, so yeah, pretty easy to find us. <laughs> Super good. So good. Well, you can find us, theonering.net at your web browser. Just go to theonering.net and there we are. But if you want to find us on socials, take out the dot and we're just the One Ring Net. Myself personally, QuickBeam2000 at all those channels. And soon I will be porting myself over to where the vault of heaven is light blue and delightful and much clearer skies, I'm told, over there. Um, Justin, you're an angel working so hard behind the scenes with the technical jiggery pokery. Thank you, Justin, again, for helping us put together a very exciting and intellectually rigorous show. I've enjoyed this so much. I can tell by the comments from our chat, they're wild about this program. We Yes, we've had a great episode today. I'll agree with you guys in the chat. It's fantastic. Welcome, everybody, once again, to Torn Tuesday as we say good night. And welcome at the same time. It's mixed signals, but we're, we're saying good night now. And until next week, please take good care of yourselves and be gentle and kind. Look out for one another because we're the best we've got right now. Okay. So <laughs> we'll see you guys next Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Until then, buenos noches, or I mean, wow, wait, I messed up my closing so bad. Okay. Good night and good luck, Mr. Murrow, the little tip of the hat to Edward R. Murrow. And better yet, Buenos noches y buena suerte. Oh, I finally got it right. There you go. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>